relate to a lot of the out a lot of the outreach and communication that we do as beaver professionals and researchers. And so the intention is really to cover this in a very generalized view that is adaptable to anything, whether you're talking to policymakers, whether you're running a nuisance um, or wildlife hotline and you're answering calls from the public, or whether you're doing some kind of targeted outreach and education to a specific type of group like school kids or you know the general public that's gathering for a beaver fest um, or anything outreach and education related to any type of audience. So certainly as I go through again, it's gonna be very generalized and we can really target things based on your interest. Again, I'm going to give an overview of conservation psychology very quickly. And then a brief introduction to behavior change models that could be an entire semester of material in itself. So this is very high level introduction. And I'm gonna actually walk through one of those behavior change models, which is the hazard acceptance model for carnivores and build it into how we can use that model and what it teaches us about communication for beaver tolerance outreach. And then we're actually gonna walk through a a grade A example of beaver outreach that uses all the components of the model I'm discussing. So as a big jumping start, um, because I know, I know not all of you are maybe familiar with the term conservation psychology, what, what is conservation psychology and why do you care? So psychology, just backstepping it, is a scientific study of mind and behavior. And what's really important is understanding that scientific part. And so this is all based on, you know, experimental or observational data that's been inputted into different models and assessed and analyzed in various ways to come up with some conclusions at the end. Conservation psychology specifically, and this is a definition from kind of the guidebook to it, is the use of psychological techniques and research to understand and promote a healthy relationship between humans and the natural environment. Again, this is a very wishy-washy definition that kind of encompasses everything and anything you can think of, but the main words to pull out of that is the healthy part, which is um, translated most effectively as sustainable. So this is some kind of relationship that's sustainable in the long term. And that the other important word to pull out of that is it's not just understanding, but it's also that application base. So the promotion of this relationship implies an application of these techniques. And that's extremely important because conservation psychology is very much geared towards application and not just research for research's sake. Now those environmental problems um, that are focused on usually in conservation psychology are caused by human behavior directly. And the idea behind this is that first you can understand the behavior from that psychological basis, and then use psychology techniques to change that behavior. And in that way, you can solve some of these extremely important environmental problems that are facing us today. And that can be everything from water pollution to um, you know, global climate change, to advanced urbanization and destruction of the natural environment and biodiversity loss, which brings us to our human beaver conflict perspective, because human beaver conflict absolute, and general human wildlife conflict absolutely falls under the auspices of conservation psychology and the goals of creating that, quote, healthy relationship between humans and the natural environment. The interesting thing about human beaver conflict is unlike most uh, human wildlife conflict, it has two focuses within conservation psychology. The first is looking at the beaver itself, right? So that's the human wildlife conflict as it affects biodiversity and biodiversity loss. So we're interested primarily in losing beavers as individual species. But the other interesting part about beavers, as we all know, is that they're keystone species. So they have significant direct and indirect impacts on overall ecosystem functioning, as well as things like climate change, right, and, and water pollution. And all of these other factors are related into beavers as keystone species. And so it's really interesting because we're doubly interested in um, mitigating human beaver conflict and promoting tolerance within conservation psychology because you kind of get a double whammy when you're dealing with beaver human conflict and solving that. So again, jumping off from understanding conservation psychology a little better, hopefully, 
This is actually a general behavior change model that this is what psychologists spend all their time doing in research is coming up with wonderful models and then testing them. This is what's called the theory of planned behavior. It's the model that is often used um, and it has encompassed the original theory of reasoned action into it to describe how you move from an individual to a decision on their behavior. So within every single person, with every single behavior they engage in, that's a reasoned behavior. And what I mean by that is not instinctual. So we're not talking about the types of instinctual behaviors that are kind of those immediate gut reaction behaviors. Like if you touch a hot stove and you pull back, we're not talking about that. We're talking about types of behavior that you actually have to kind of think about in order to engage in them. In this case, we're interested in this very big, scary model because the end behavior is that tolerance behavior. And I'll define the tolerance behavior later, but it's just important to remember that that's the kind of behavior we're interested in pulling through this model. The only thing you need to take away from this giant, scary model is that it's very important to understand that the basis for all of these connector points building out to the behavior are background factors that are very contextual. So they are very specific to the individual, that's your audience, as well as the social ecological system context. So those are things like the demographics, the culture, the religion that the people are located in, as well as the information that's being um, passed around in their general environment that they're exposed to and that they pay attention to. So those are things like persuasive messages that they're getting through, you know, their friends, their family, the media, and then their general their general knowledge of issues, which is very largely tied to their educational background. Um, but what, again, I really want you to take away from this is that the basis that's really driving all these other decisions that go on in your brain before you make a behavior are things that are very individualistic and they are very contextual. And that's what you have to concentrate on as you fill in all of the other spaces moving out to the behavior in terms of where you're gonna make your intervention. So pulling back from that general model of behavior, these are some of the wildlife tolerance models that exist out there in the literature. These are the two that you'll see the most often referenced anytime you're looking at anybody trying to talk about um, not only uh, in terms of outreach and education that's based on psychology, but just understanding um, human wildlife conflict in an overall sense. And so the one on the right, we're not gonna focus on today, um, but it's the wildlife tolerance model. As you can see, it has a lot of the same components as the one we are going to focus in on, which is the hazard acceptance model over here. So things like costs are covered as well as benefits. And then within this inner model here, what you'll see is a lot of the things that came from this background factor model here. And again, it's just important not maybe to focus on those in detail right now, but just to know that it is important to focus this on detail when you're coming up with your outreach and education messaging to make sure it's appropriate for whatever audience you're trying to reach out to. Having said that, we are going to focus on this model today, which is a hazard acceptance model. Um, it was first defined in 2014, so it was the wildlife tolerance model. It was a great year for wildlife tolerance modeling, apparently. Um, and this one was originally developed for large carnivores, but since that time, it has been used for a wide variety of human wildlife conflict scenarios, and it was specifically designed in order to be a tool for doing any kind of education and communication with the public. Again, about carnivores, but since that time, it's been found scientifically effective for everything from alligators in Florida to elephants in India. And so it certainly is applicable beyond kind of the terrestrial large carnivore realm for a wide variety of other animals that are engaged in any kind of hazard creation for humans. And that is the source of the conflict. And certainly in beavers, this is applicable because as I don't need to tell you, you all know this very well, that beavers are seen as a hazard to our infrastructure. And in some cases, in, in terms of them having beaver fever or rabies, they are seen as a hazard to our own personal well being and the well being of our animals and that sort of thing. Um, 
The important thing to pull out of this paper and keep in mind that this is based on psychological research, again, that was risk-based judgment and decision-making. So we are coming at this model and it, treating beavers as that risk and that people are coming towards their decision-making in beavers from a risk-based judgment perspective. It's also important to keep in mind through all of this and anything in psychology, this is the key point, people are not entirely rational. So they are not making these decisions based on a rational cost-benefit analysis alone. That certainly is a big component of it and the conscious evaluation um, and logistical thinking through um, the characteristics of beavers and then other wildlife species in this general model is kind of combined and attenuated by that intuitive, so subconscious, not actually thinking and planning out emotional processing of information. So again, this is a conscious and a subconscious combination as you are moving through your decision making and what behavior you're going to engage in. And this sounds very complicated, but some of these can be split second decisions. So we're not talking about a sitting down and actually thinking about your emotions and thinking about the cost benefit analysis. Sometimes these are just gut reactions that happen very quickly in your brain as you're deciding what to do with the beaver looking at you straight in the face. Another thing to keep in mind that's very important walking through this model is that perceptions are as important and in some cases are more important than reality. So when we're talking about the cost benefit analysis between you know, benefits and the costs of beavers, it's not a rational, calculation all the time, people's perceptions of benefits and their perceptions of the risks or costs of having beavers around are often more important than the actual real benefits or actual real risks and costs. And they're also very individualistic. And so um, it's, it's based on the environment as well as the individual, like I said before, all those background factors, how they are calculating these perceptions of benefits and perceptions of risks and costs. Another thing that's really important to keep in mind as I walk through this model is that it only uh, adapts to kind of this motivation. So it's speaking to how can we motivate people to have tolerance or acceptance for beavers. It's not a addressing the opportunities they have to express that behavior or the ability to express that behavior. So what I'm talking about is we can control in a way or not control. We can influence and be persuasive towards people's intention to behave a certain way. But if they don't have the opportunity to behave in that way, that behavior isn't going to take place. So we can make people love beavers and we can make them want to help beavers but if they don't have an opportunity to engage in that behavior, they won't. If we tell them to love behavior, love beavers, but we don't tell them how to operationalize that, you know, by writing your congressperson and telling them to support the DAMS Act, then they won't actually engage in any kind of behavior towards that line. The other thing is that we need they need to have the ability to engage in the behavior. Um, we've talked about this a lot in the working groups about how there's a constraint on people actually using beaver coexistence devices or engaging in beaver restoration on their on their land because of these kind of stumbling blocks in the process, either from a funding perspective or a policy, you know, permitting perspective or having accessibility of people to actually come out and do the work on their site who are knowledgeable and have expertise in that area. And so as much as we can promote beaver coexist the use of beaver coexistence devices, if these people don't have a realistic ability to use those for whatever reason and whatever constraints exist, then they're not gonna engage in using them. They're not gonna have that behavior be expressed. Another thing to keep in mind for the application of this model is that you can't just pick and choose the pieces of this model that work for you and what information you have or the target audience that you're engaging with. Um, you have to use all this piece, all the pieces of this model in concert, otherwise it starts to break down. Uh, this was shown brilliantly in this paper that used this model, um, and it was actually part of the way they developed this model was they were doing um, public outreach as far as bears in Ohio, I believe it was. 
And they found out that when they were giving messaging to the general public, when all they did was talk about ways that the public could avoid or reduce risks of interaction with bears, that when they did not also include the benefits of bears, that it actually lowered the tolerance of the general public versus what they were prior to receiving the messaging. So what that means is before they even got the messaging of how to reduce risks engaging with bears, they were more tolerant than after the messaging they got, learning all the ways that they could avoid these risks without learning the benefits of bears. So that's important for us to remember because we shouldn't just tell people all the time about all the coexistence work they can do without also putting in concert with that message the benefits of beavers and why they should engage in this type of control over hazard measures. And I'll go over that again. Um, also, tolerance was increased the most overall from that baseline, pre-messaging baseline, when information about benefits and ways to control the risks were put together. So again, not just talking about the benefits, but talking about the benefits of beavers and the ways that you can control the risks of beavers, whatever those risks may be for the specific audience. And I keep harping on this because it's so important, but you really need to target your message content and the way you execute that message, so delivery of that message to whatever specific audience you're trying to reach. Um, we all know this, that you know, in terms of things like benefits and risks and costs, that is going to vary based very largely on who your audience is. So what is going to resonate with that audience is very much based on doing that kind of free marketing um, research and understanding the motivations of your audience, understanding their interests in the various risks and potential benefits of beavers and really targeting the message to be most effective for that specific audience. And I'm certainly happy to talk with any and all of you about that and, and working towards that for specific audience members. It's That is a science in and of itself. It's a really exciting one and there's a lot of work to do in it in terms of researching the best way to do that. So anybody who wants to do that, I'm happy to work with you. Now actually getting into the model. I know we're 18 minutes in and I'm just now entering into the model, but I just really wanted to lay the foundation to jump in. Tolerance um, is a very controversial word, actually, in the human wildlife conflict and conservation psychology literature. Nobody can really agree on the best definition of tolerance. So I am just using this definition. I really like it as accepting wildlife and or wildlife behaviors that one dislikes. What I like about this specific definition is it's not only an action, but it can also be an attitude. And that's really important because people may not always have the opportunity to engage in an actual um, action of accepting wildlife, but they can always have an attitude of acceptance towards wildlife or the behaviors of wildlife that are inconvenient or risky towards them. The other thing that's good about this definition is it accepts or it incorporates different degrees of acceptance. And so what I mean by that is that you may have just the very, very basic, you accept the beaver, it's in your environment. This is over here, you can see this is from Heidi's area. So this is when the beavers were still there. People see them, they're not really in their face. They don't have to interact with them in any kind of risky, costly situation. They're just kind of background noise, right? And they accept their background noise and that's fine. But then there's the, uh, the other end of what this definition of tolerance is, which is what most people call stewardship. And that means that you are actively going out of your way to go above and beyond to help that specific species in some very active way. So in this case, it would be you know going out and finding those beavers and giving them the carrots and really making them happy and fat in your, your backyard because you never want them to leave. You know, Putting little heaters in their dams in winter so they're nice and warm and cozy. That would be the extreme end of stewardship under this definition. For the means of this talk, I'm just talking about that entire degree. So everything from just seeing them in the background and not being bothered by it, all the way up to actually, you know, going out and rubbing and massaging their little beaver feet at night. Um, so jumping into what affects tolerance. Well, tolerance in this model is directly affected 
by perceptions of risks and costs, which I'm going to talk about right now, perceptions of benefits, and then affect, which is emotion for the species. So we're going to backtrack directly from these and talk about each of these components and what they are and how you can put them into whatever education and outreach you're doing. So again, perceptions is what's really important in the perceptions of risks and costs. These are not necessarily true, but they are true to the person that holds that perception, right? So the again, the likelihood of the risk and the actual costs are often mismatched with the perception of risk and cost. So it's very easy to deal with risks and costs that are not reason, real in terms of your education and outreach messaging. All you have to do is explain the beavers do not eat fish, right? The beavers eat plants. So when you have any kind of beaver myth, the easiest way to attenuate this perception of risk and cost is to acknowledge that I acknowledge that you think that beavers eat fish, but they actually are vegetarians. They do not eat fish. This does not happen, right? And that's a really good way to provide education to reduce this perception of risk or cost. It's a lot more difficult when you're dealing with risks or costs that are actual and real. Um, kind of on the back end of that is a little test for all of us as well when I'm talking about the concept that the likelihood of risk and the likelihood of um, having these actual costs are mismatched with your evaluation of them is a, a good example is shark attack right? So the odds of getting killed by a shark is one in almost 4 million. The odds of dying in a car accident are one in 84, and the odds of drowning are one in 1,134. However, think about you and yourself going into potentially shark-infested waters. Let's say you're in Hawaii, you're going to a beach, there's been tiger shark attacks here before. Actually, you guys in Cape Cod, you have great white sharks now. You're going out into the ocean, you know there are sharks around, you know there have been attacks in the past at this area, let's say. I guarantee you, as you're walking into that water, that you are much more afraid of getting killed by a shark than you are of drowning. And you are much more afraid of getting killed by a shark than you are of dying in a car accident on your drive home from the beach, right? And even when you're aware of the odds of dying from each of these risks, you are still more afraid when you walk into that water of that shark than you are of drowning or dying in the car ride home, even when you know this. So in these cases, it's not as simple as just explaining to people how, oh, the risk of that is very low. Oh, the cost of that is only a few dollars. It's only a few dollars to fix that tree. You know, you lose a tree, you, you know, buy a new one for a couple of bucks. That's not how it works in people's brains. So the, the likelihood of risk, the actual costs are very often mismatched with the reality. And so it's a little harder to dispel that just by sharing the actual facts and information behind the situation. What you need to do is you need to counterbalance those perceptions of risks and costs with the perceived benefits. So in this case, as you can see in this model, these two are at the same level in terms of how they affect people's behavior. So how can you attenuate this perception of risks and costs? Well, what you can do is up your perceptions of benefits so that when people are calculating out that cost benefit analysis, right, in their brain through that logical conscious evaluation, then you're kind of outweighing the risks by telling them all of the benefits. Another option, as you can see from this model, is that what we're calling control over hazard. And those are all the, we're gonna talk about that in detail, but effectively these are all your coexistence devices. These are all the ways that people can coexist with beavers or avoid having beaver problems in the first place. So prevention methods, as well as mitigation methods. If you explain those, they can actually reduce the perceptions of risk and cost because you're working out with the people, yes, this is a risk, this is a cost, but here are ways you can avoid it or here are ways you can deal with it when it happens and it's really not that bad. So those are ways you can kind of attack these perceptions of risk and costs that are real. Another thing to keep in mind as you're thinking about ways to deal with these perceptions of risk and cost is that a lot of research has been done in this area, not only in human wildlife, 
um, but in general risk. So a lot in the health literature, actually health communication, because diseases are as much risk as, you know, human beaver conflict to people. Intangible costs and risks are much more important when people do their calculations of risks and benefits than are tangible. And the way this is defined is tangible risks or costs are those that have monetary value. So those are ones that you actually can quantify in some kind of monetary value system. Intangible are things that don't have any monetary value. So these are things like stress or fear. And those are much more important driving people's tolerance or intolerance of wildlife and behaviors, I'm um, sorry, and beavers, than are the things that are monetary. So just telling people things like, oh, you can save money by doing this is not as important as telling them, you know, hitting on those kind of intangible things like, it's okay, the aesthetics of your backyard is not going to be ruined by the pond. It's actually going to be increased because think of all the bird life you'll have and all the, you know, butterflies and vegetation and that's so much more aesthetically pleasing. That's an intangible benefit more than, you know, a tangible benefit. And again, it's really important to foc not focus on risks and how to avoid risks as much as the benefits. So anytime you're talking about these risks, even if you're really focusing on that control over hazard part of the model up here, you absolutely need to include the benefits as well. And you don't want to only focus on this end of the model and trying to fix it. You also need to boost your benefits as you're doing this work. Perceptions of benefits. This is a great one for beavers because we have so many benefits to highlight in terms of beavers. And this is, again, not only the things about beavers species specific, but things about beavers that they have um, based on their keystone species role. So indirect and direct costs of beaver, you know, so all of the things that they help with in terms of climate change adaptation um, and resilience, all the things they help with from, you know, preventing wildfires to cleaning up fresh water resources to creating biodiversity. All of those things are great to highlight no matter what message you're giving. Again, make sure there's something that resonates with your audience. So if you're talking to an audience on the East Coast, they're probably not going to be as interested in the drought prevention, um, water storage in terms of drought prevention as if you're doing an uh, outreach program in the West. And similarly, if you're out west, you're probably not going to have to focus as much on the flooding mitigation benefits of beavers as you are on the east or in the south where we have massive flooding issues in certain areas. So just make sure that it's really focused towards your audience. Um, again, I want to highlight that it's, you know, anything that focuses solely on the risk perceptions over here may decrease tolerance. So you absolutely have to include benefits in whatever messaging you're doing. Um, in fact, benefit perceptions in the studies that have followed this model um, are a better predictor than risk perceptions of tolerance behavior. So they've when they've gone out to people and looked at people who do tolerate, um, in this case, tigers in Nepal and wolves and black bears in the US, when they have people divided into those who are tolerant and those who are intolerant, they found that those who have those higher uh, perceptions of benefits for the species are more often tolerant than those who have lower risk perceptions. I hope that made sense. But it's very much more important that people have a good and solid understanding and buy-in to the benefits of these species. And again, this is perfect counterbalance to their perceptions of risks and costs. And just like with risks and costs, it has been found through research that those intangible benefits are much more valued and are much bigger drivers of the actual behavior than are the tangible ones. So again, the monetary things are important, but they're not as important as hitting on those intangible benefits. So as much as we think from a policy perspective, it is important to have a quantification and monetary terms of the benefits of beavers and their roles in the ecosystems, when you're actually talking to people one-on-one -on -one or a general audience, it's actually those things that are intangible that are more important than the monetary value of beavers. Now, control over hazard, I'm gonna fly through because all of you are already experts, I think, on this. And this is any kind of preventative or mitigation measure 
that can reduce your risks or costs. And again, it's really important to include those in all your messaging, including to children. It's really important to start early to let them know that yes, we're not ignoring that there are risks or costs to beavers, but you can control that. And this is so important, it's been found that people's perceived ability to control these risks and costs is so important for them reducing in that risk cost in the, sorry, cost benefit analysis in their brain that's going on, that it reduces those risks and costs in that analysis in their brain. Social trust is also an incredibly important component of this. So that's trust in you because as a management person going out there, you represent management agencies because all of you are going to be going out there probably and doing this coexistence work yourself and giving people advice on beavers in general. So we're considering you management agencies in a sense, but it's really important that they trust you. So if you're going to do this outreach and education, it's incredibly important that these people trust you in order to understand what you're saying about the perceptions of risks and costs and the perceptions of benefits. So this is also important for us to realize when we're working with management agencies is that that alignment has to be a trusting alignment for the audience that is hearing this messaging because you being aligned with, let's say, fish and wildlife in a certain area, Texas, where they don't like fish and wildlife folks, it may be a bad alignment for you to do your outreach through U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in some of these regions because there's that distrust that exists and the people aren't going to trust what you say. So they may bounce up the risks and costs just by you telling them they're not issues. They may be like, oh, they must really be issues because I know not to trust these folks. OK, hopefully the audience already trusts you. But if they don't, if there's some reason they're really just super anti, you know, the organization that you work with or represent, it may be better to feed some of these messages through some, some entity that they trust. And this is something we've been talking about in the management working groups is under, that's an important component of us moving forward as a beaver community is understanding who these different target audiences trust, who they're getting their information from so that we can start feeding this information that we've developed through those channels so that they can have that trust and, and understand the benefits and risks and costs at face value. Another thing is that it's very hard to gain trust, but it is extremely easy to lose. So as you're doing outreach and education, another thing to keep in mind when you're doing this model is never lie, never exaggerate benefits, never under, <laughs> undersell risks or costs. You should always acknowledge there are risks and costs to behavior um, beavers because there are. Always acknowledge those and always acknowledge the limits of the benefits as well. That we know beavers are beneficial in cleaning up freshwater systems, but under these circumstances. Because if any of your audience finds out that you lied to them about something or that you undersold some kind of risk or cost, that will exaggerate their correction of that lie. So now they will believe not just, oh, it's slightly higher a risk than you said. Now they're going to be like, it's 100% a risk. This is a problem now because I can't trust you. I know it's the exact opposite end of the spectrum. So it's extremely important, any outreach or education you do, that you maintain that social trust and be constantly trying to build that social trust. There are two types of trust. Um, one is relational trust, and that's an assessment of shared values and goals. So these are the types of things when you're highlighting the things that you share with the audience. And that can be anything from, hey, you know, I have lived in Massachusetts all my life. I know what the problems with beavers are. And this is what I've come up with as a strategy to live with beavers, enjoy their benefits. But this is how we can reduce the risks that we know beavers have and I'm from your backyard, I know what it is, I've been in your same shoes, right? And this can be based on anything. So anything, any way you can connect directly with your audience. And again, be trustworthy. Do not find some random thing and say, oh, me too, I also belong to that club or that religion that you are. Find a real connecting point and use that. Another great way to do this is to co-produce messages with the members of the target audience. So meet with some of the people that you really wanna reach out to, like cattle ranchers in the West. 
meet with some of the target audience where they are already coexisting with beavers happily and it's working for them and work with them to create this education and outreach. Have them be your your channel to outreach with the cattle raisers. Have them tell them the messages that you have co-produced. Again, it's important that that's an equal co-production messages, not just you saying, here, tell them this, but working with them and trying to fill out this model with what resonates with them and what they think is important to, to explain to other cattle raisers in this case. The other type of trust is calculative trust. And this is based on your past performance and how that's evaluated by your audience. So they're basically looking at you and saying, so you tell me I can, I can live with beavers and this coexistence device is gonna work based on what? And this is the point where you're telling them, you know, use this con level or I've used it in a hundred situations and 95 of those 100 situations it worked. So if you can tout your own success, if you can document some type of proof of success, that's really important. And it's just as important to have anecdotal accounts as it is to have those better kind of documented scientific accounts of the efficacy of whatever you're doing. But it's really important to highlight both. So have the trust you build by connecting with your audience, as well as having that trust of proving kind of that this is going to work based on past success. And then finally, affect for species. So this is that subconscious level and emotion. And I will tell you, this is probably the most important aspect of the entire model, which I saved for last. So it's fresh in your brain coming out of this presentation. But this is any kind of positive, negative, or it can be a mix and one emotion can win in certain contexts, contexts over the other. But this is the emotional affect that they have for beavers. This is they love them, they hate them, or they love them when they're cute little babies, but they hate them when they're old and chopping down their trees, right? Those are what you're working for. And it's the most important driver in many cases of how people are going to react to species. Because not only can it directly impact the tolerance people have for these beavers, as I'm sure you all know, if they love beavers, they are going to let the beavers cut down every tree in their yard because they just love the beavers, right? And if they just hate the beavers, that beaver may not even be anywhere near their property, but they are going to kill it because they hate beavers and they are destructive little devils from hell for all of humanity, right? So affect for species can directly impact the behavior. It can also impact the behavior by attenuating this perception of benefit or perception of risks or costs. So what that means is that if you have a very high level of love for beavers, you are going to inflate your perception of their benefits and decrease your perception of their risks and costs. And adversely, if you have a hatred for beavers, that's going to reduce the perception of benefits and increase the perception of risks and costs in your brain when you're calculating out that cost benefit analysis, which is what you're going to use in that conscious level of deciding whether you're going to tolerate or not tolerate that beaver being on your property or in your area. Uh, I'm just making sure I covered everything there. Again, I think this is pretty intuitive. Most of us know that people who really have a very strong emotional um, connection or strong emotional outlet for beavers, or in this case, the behaviors of beavers. So they may love beavers until the beavers are actually doing something that is adverse towards them, their infrastructure, or their well-being in the case of, you know, vineyards or um, timber production or farmers. So it's just extremely important that you address affect for the species and whatever outreach or educational messaging you're doing. And again, that has to fit very well with your audience. So showing beaver, baby beaver videos is really great, except maybe not for cattle ranchers. They really don't care that much about that. So you're gonna have to find another way to maybe attenuate their negative perceptions and affect for beavers through other channels. A great way to do it, by the way, and this was discovered out um, on the Botswana Cheetah Conservation Project. This is just a little aside, but it's a great anecdote. They were having a lot of problems with cattle ranchers killing cheetahs. 
and they tried to do outreach through other cattle ranchers who are doing coexistence with cheetahs. They tried to do it by targeting the wives of the cattle ranchers because it's a very male dominated business in Botswana. And they and they tried to do it, you know, at cattle ranching associations and have cattle ranchers just hear this from general people. They did very targeted cattle rancher to cattle rancher. They did very targeted wives to cattle rancher husbands. Didn't work. What they discovered worked was the only people who had sway in the very big manly cattle ranchers in Botswana were their daughters. They started doing targeted outreach and education programs for the daughters of cattle ranchers in very high-end private schools in Botswana. And they instantly, apparently, like within a week, started getting calls from some of these cattle ranchers that they had historically had problems with that they would just go out and annihilate any cheetahs on their property. They got calls from them saying, well, we have cheetahs. They've been attacking the calves. Can you come get them? Um, and they will not relocate cheetahs in Botswana because it, it never works. It always is a failing prospect. And so they let them know that. They let them know the things that they could do to try to reduce the risk of calf attacks. And finally, they heard from the one who was like the biggest offender of all, let them know that, well, I guess I'm just going to have to lose some calves every year because his daughter loves cheetahs and won't let him touch the cheetahs. And, you know, OK, maybe she's got a point. They're kind of cute. So <laughs> this story is basically to show you that you have to be creative sometimes in addressing that effect for species and how you get at it, and also addressing who you're going to uh, uh, impact with that outreach and education that's going to move on and impact the actual target audience that you're interested in, because you may not be able to reach out to them directly. You may have to go a circuitous route through somebody else who does have that impact on the audience. Anyway, I wanted to end the presentation with a, a, an excellent outreach and education message that was developed by Human Beaver Coexistence Fund, which we all know is Allison, who is hopefully still here on the call. I can't see you, but I hope you are still there. Um, because this is an excellent example of using the components of that hazard acceptance model within an outreach and educational messaging that includes beavers. So as we can see, there were not... Um, we are starting off with that control over hazard. We're giving people educational messages about the different ways that they can prevent any problems with beavers or mitigate any problems that they're having with beavers in the real world, right? So we're not ignoring that there are problems. We're acknowledging beavers create risks. We're not focusing on them. We're focusing on the ways that you can have control over that hazard and either prevent or mitigate these risks and costs that are Attend that go along with beavers in your environment. But also we're highlighting the benefits of beavers. They are amazing wetland producers, right? They are keystone species. They give us wetlands and all of the direct and indirect benefits of wetlands we can thank our wetland protector, the beaver for. So we're highlighting those benefits. So we're providing control over hazard. We're acknowledging the risks in a realistic sense but we're then saying and ending on the high note of that positive benefits that beavers have for us. And of course, we're addressing affect directly by anthropomorphizing the beaver, which actually is a good thing. There's been a lot of studies showing that when people anthropomorphize species like beavers, it's actually a positive in terms of boosting the affect they have for that species, which then boosts the tolerance they have for that species. So our cute little bubbles here is really boosting that affect part of that equation. And so, as we can see, we have an excellent example of how we move through using cost. We acknowledge the risks and costs, but then we attenuate them with the positive benefits and we modify them by explaining how they have control over these various hazards that we acknowledge. And then aren't they so freaking cute and you love beavers now, right? And then hopefully at the end of this, people will have more and an elevated tolerance towards beavers. So when they're ever in a situation where they need to act in relation to beavers and they have the ability to act in relation to beavers, it will be in a tolerant manner. So thank you all for attending. This is the end of my slide presentation. Again, thank you to the communications working group for hosting this and my husband for listening to me babble about this for the last few, well now month. And if anybody wants any citations that I referenced here, I'm happy to share them.
Also, I'm giving a call out for our new webinar series, Beavers Uncovered, because next week is our first webinar. So please join us. We're going to have a really exciting panel discussion with folks who are working um, with beavers on the edge of their range. So both along the frontera in Arizona and Mexico, and then along in the Arctic and hear about the similarities and differences in the systems. So thank you. And that's it. Awesome. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, that was amazing. I, I I have a lot of questions, but I um are, are just ideas really too more more than just questions. Um, but I would love to open it up. You know, th th as I mentioned, this is our first time doing the webinar format, so we don't get to see all of your lovely faces. I don't know if there's an option to make that happen suddenly, but um, yeah. if there's not, please feel free to put in a question. You know, I heard from some folks that it was working, and from others it wasn't. So, um. First off, I just wanted, one of the things that I thought about, Bonnie, as I was lis listening to this, especially surrounding um, like the path to tolerance, is sort of equating it to a bit like um, sort of around CB CBT, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, right? And that mm -hmm. recent studies are finding that, you know, it's not as, uh, talk therapy is not as effective as actually changing behaviors, right? And being able to know yeah. what those are and being able to like redirect in that way. So you know, even, even on for, I always tell the story of how, you know, growing up, I was really taught and it was imbued in me to not only fear animals, but that fear often translated very one-to-one -to, -one to hatred. Right. And those, um, those knee-jerk reactions, even into even my consciousness being aware that there's no reason to fear the big spider over in the corner, but that fear yeah. is so innately uh, built into my structure that as a grown adult who has now been trying to relinquish that fear for over 20 years, that, that is still there. And um, I don't know, I just, just thinking about the way CBT could, could be drawn into this or just how any thoughts you have about that and behavioral change on that level. Yeah, that's an excellent point. I think that there are some affects, right? Those emotional gut reactions, subconscious level, um, reactions to the animals that you're never going to get over there. It, it's been shown that affect is the hardest thing to change when it is very ingrained in those background factors that I was talking about, which is your case. Exactly. Right. It was taught to you. So you have that information that you were exposed to. And then also just the culture you were surrounded with was that was the dominant norm. Right. Um, that it's in those cases, it's, it's more effective to target, like you said, like kind of the more conscious behavior. So target that cost risk analysis, uh, cost risk benefit analysis aspect of that, of that tolerance model. And so what can work is you can override to a degree the affect if you have people stop and think about what they're doing. So if that's your messaging, where you know you know they're always going to hate the beaver deep down inside. It's just something that's so subconscious and it's so part of how they were raised or an identity of who they are. That what you can do is override it basically by by trying to get them to use that conscious reasoning more so than they do that gut reaction. And a lot of that is slowing down the reactive the reactive space, right? So having them think before they act and that's what you're driving at so the behavior you're driving at first is trying to get them to think before they act and then the second behavior you're driving at driving at is that tolerance behavior and so what that can help you do is say like you know before you go out and shoot every animal on your property why don't you think about what the animal has benefit wise for you and in the long run is it a good idea to shoot them or not shoot them? And then once they get to that point where, okay, yeah, I will, I'll, I'll be more conscious about how I go out and deal with the things on my property, then you can get to that next step of, and so by the way, beavers, <laughs> you know, it's more beneficial to have beavers than to not have beavers on your property for these reasons and whatever reasons are important to that target audience. Does that make sense? So it's kind of, it makes your job harder because it's a stepwise process versus a just like, hey, tolerate beavers. But it it's easier. Also, I think the other thing is have target audiences that are younger because you have more of a chance to drive that effect. So again, like Allison's here, but you know, a lot of our folks who who focus on the younger crowd, that's a very important target 
age to hit that affect because you still have a chance to really back out of a lot of things that get ingrained later in life. Right. So I, I love the the phrase slowing down reactivity. I think that's yeah. all fronts in our world right now, slowing down and reactivity. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Yeah, um, definitely. And I see that uh, Tony had her hand up. The chat is disabled, but if you go to the Q&A, um, you, can, you can ask a question there, Tony. Um, and yes, this will be made available, this video, uh, as long as Bonnie's okay with that. Um, yeah, absolutely. Because uh, someone said they'd like to share with their staff um, training for all wildlife projects. So we will get that posted and let you know where this is at. Um, and if you want me to do a talk, just and that way I can answer too for any questions I have, just let me know. I'm happy to throw this out for any anything. And I will say that I have this in a different module because I gave a different version of this for um, wildlife rehab group. So I have a generic, like all wildlife issues, one, two. That's great. Allison had a question. Uh, I find myself withholding certain benefit info and highlighting others. Is there an approach that cate the categories those factors based on certain existing perceptions or attitudes? Yeah, that's a good question. So yeah, I I think that that is something that you really need to target to your audience. And again, that's where I was hearkening back to the market research. So um, a lot of that marketing research, a lot of times is trying to figure out what benefits and costs resonate with people. And again, that's not necessarily a specific benefit or cost. It can be categories of benefits and costs. So like I was saying before, you know, there are tangible and intangible benefits and costs. And um, depending on your audience, those will vary categorically. So, you know, aesthetics may be very important for a certain target audience versus, you know, the stress or fear factor that people feel. Um, and I think, yeah, I it's it's this balance of, of your gut reaction of what you expect your, your target audience will, will react to well. And also doing that if you have the funding to do the market research behind it. And certainly that's something I think we at Beaver Institute are inter interesting moving forward with the working groups is doing some of that, that heavy lifting, doing the social science side of this and trying to figure out some of those benefits and costs that will resonate with people in particular in relation to beavers. But certainly you do need to, to really target those costs and benefits to your specific audience. Otherwise they can lose interest and worst case scenario, like they just totally turn off and they don't listen to anything you're saying or they they go the opposite direction. This is always one of the terrible things about outreach and education is when it backfires. And for whatever reason, people go the opposite side of the spectrum because they don't like your message or they don't trust you or they have a bad reaction to something in your presentation. So. I don't know if that answered your question. I hope so. <laughs> but. Yes, Allison said, thank you. And thanks for sharing bubbles. And Tony asked, uh, <laughs> can we purchase uh, that visual that the card showed at the end? I will direct you to Allison at the Human Beaver yes. Systems Fund because that is all their work, her work. So, and uh, yes. a designer friend of hers. A plus. Yeah, uh, it's yeah. amazing. Yeah, to be to be shared widely over and over again. So thank you, Beaver yes. Human Conflict uh, Fund. Um, and just I, coming off of this, I know we're getting short on time, but just wanted to say like, this idea of, of who's the best person to talk to which audience, right? You know, just recently, yeah. actually a few people on this call with me, uh, with us, Tony and Dan and I all went to a conference and uh, throughout the day sort of talking to different folks and sort of identifying who's the best and like, you know, folks who who had a lot of knowledge were wondering about like beaver management practices and techniques. It was like, thank goodness Dan was there, you know, and and Tony with a policy and sort of more community background. And then myself, my yeah. favorite person is the person who always comes and goes, beavers, they got their own institute now. And I'm like, all right, let's talk, you know. So <laughs> yeah. I think it's interesting being able to identify where you're like, where your strong suit is and then like identify yeah. where maybe you, you can amplify those other areas. So um, I think there's a lot here that can be carried forward throughout the communications working group as we think about psychology and, and interaction. And Mike, I think, did you have your hand up? I want to make sure that you get get your thoughts in. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, well, first, I just want to say thanks, Bonnie. That was, that was really good. And I was really impressed with the research that showed that just talking about how to manage the risks wasn't enough. 
And sometimes that has an opposite effect. And that mm -hmm. is an actionable item for me because while I try usually to do that, I don't always do that, you know? And so, you know, I could be, uh, you know, more effective if I'm making sure that everyone gets those benefit things, you know, in fairness, some of some people aren't ready to hear it, <laughs> I think. Yeah. Um, but in general, that's a good thing to know and act on. And then and one one quick question, I guess, is that, um, you know, on Allison's lovely uh, graphic there, um, you kind of implied that hit them with the benefits towards the end. Is that true or is that a case? So that's case? actually... Yeah, so that's, I, I know I said that, and I think that's a, in general, that's been argued to be the case. Um, there has been some research that's been coming out, and actually, it's it's interesting because it's coming out of the health world. So I have, I've been reading on health communication simultaneously as human wildlife conflict, just luckily, because that's where my interest is in One Health. But health communication, it has the same underlying principles psychologically, like I was saying before, it's a risk, right? And they've been finding in the health world that um, it's target based, your target audience based, whether you should give your benefits up front or at the end. And it's a very interesting, and I actually don't like know this offhand, I would have to go look at it, but they've been finding like there are different target audiences that respond to each differently. And a lot of times it's based on, um, their underlying motivators towards doing the health behavior. So whether it's coming from a protective stance or kind of that fear-based stance. And so I can't remember which was which, but it was that, you know, if you give your, your benefits up front, sometimes it's more important to do that for people. I think it was the fear-based people because you kind of relieve them. Um, and then they can listen to the rest of your message. And then for the other folks, it was more important to give it at the end. And again, because it's something that you take away. And a lot of times people remember the things that hit you on the emotional level and the things that were the ending points or things that were repeated. So those are like the three things that are remembered the most by people usually after a presentation. Um, and so... I said that just kind of because I think that's the general thinking is that you hit like your strong suit at the end. But I think there are certainly cases where that can be adapted based on your target audience. If you have a very specific target audience, like if you're dealing with the general public, you're not going to know, like, are people more motivated by fear or more motivated by wanting to be protected? Um, but certainly like if you're, you know, in a closed space, giving a talk to a room full of people that you kind of know what you're, you're coming into, you can do more targeted presentations that are lined up. Um, repetition is very important. Like I said before, and like you probably saw in my presentation, I repeated some of the things over and over because that's something that really sticks with people is if you repeat things over and over. So I've kind of, as you saw, adapted my presentations to include important, important points a couple times. And people can get annoyed with it and be like, God, you already said that like five times. But then they'll also remember that the best. So in a month when you talk to them, that's the thing that they remember from your talk. So it's annoyance Thank at you. first, but it gets in there. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank and then... I was just going to follow up like uh, what you were saying about the policy. I think that's something that a lot of people don't realize. I think a lot of people who are targeting education for general groups or for children, they they are more um, engaged in using conservation psychology and psychology in general to do their messaging. But I think a lot of people who deal with policymakers and decision makers, um, and agency personnel that they forget that they are exactly the same kind of target audience that you're you're doing this education and outreach to. And I think they don't that people who are, you know, going into a room of policy makers don't use these psychological tricks as well as people who are going into a room of school children and they know what they want to like cover and hit. 
And you forget, I think a lot of times that people who are professionals in the, or even, you know, scientists, researchers, you forget that people who are in these professional settings are, are just as psychologically relevant um, in doing outreach and education as our children and as are the general public um, and as are any other target audience that you're hitting. Um, and I think it's very underused in, in discussions and in outreach to policymakers and decision makers. So I think that's a, an excellent area to, to engage in this type of research um, in the future to try to, to figure out better how to use psychology in, in adapting to those kind of target audiences. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> Bonnie, and, and thank you everyone um, who is here. We're gonna be sharing this. Uh, to, to be shared then wide, widely, because this has been a fantastic presentation. So thank you so much, Bonnie, um, for mm, this. Thank you, guys. And uh, if you have any questions or follow-up, you know where, where to reach Bonnie at beaverinstitute.org or, or me or Mike at, at beaverinstitute.org. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all soon. So I think that's it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Happy rest of your Wednesday, everyone.